say this once when he was talking about his congregation. He, he said, you know, the song from Willie Nelson just describes it best, probably more than Willie Nelson sang it, but that song, You're, All, You're Always On My Mind. I, there's hardly a conversation Marilyn and I have that don't include you guys. And, and I know when I was an assistant pastor, I saw things a little differently. And when you have the heart of the daddy heart of the pastor, you, you tend to be a little bit more gracious and let people get away with more things. Um, so just be patient with us, pray for us. And uh, if need be, step in. You know, this whole dynamic of the prodigal son, the, the big brother, you know, sometimes maybe to a fault, I'm probably more accessible than any pastor on earth. I am the last one, besides Cisco and whoever's cleaning the kitchen, usually the last one to leave this place. Yeah. <laughs> There's four or five people that are here, and we're always the last one, hey, how you doing? You know, because we know who we are. So, so, and, and when I go downstairs, and we have a meal, it's for that purpose, so we can be family. And if you notice, when I go downstairs, I will try to find the most place where there's nobody sitting. It's not because I'm antisocial. I just want to give more people. I don't want to sit with the same people every week. So I sit down in those places so people can come sit because they want to talk to me. And if it's a little bit person, personal, just hang around because eventually everybody will be gone and we'll be there alone. <laughs> so if you rush out of here, you may not have the relationship you want or you, but we're here and, and you know the Smiths have come they, they kind of fill right in they're usually one of the last ones here which is a pastor's heart so we're here for you and, you know my wife says to me sometimes I'm oblivious <laughs> help me out <laughs> if you go with Bruce up well he should have known well I'm oblivious <laughs> you tell me I'm like oh okay So, we're family. Let, let's make sure we keep it that way. So the message I'm continuing in, the title is The Heart of the Gospel. It's funny, every preacher would say, this is the most important message you'll ever hear. This, this might be, though. Because without this, we're nothing. The heart of the gospel is, is love. Specifically, the love of God towards us this way. And our response to that love. That, that is the whole heart of the gospel. Everything stems from there. The story of the Bible, creation, redemption, is all the story about a father wanting a family. And we are that family. A, a father that we sang it that, that is madly and deeply in love with us. You know, it's, it's interesting... You know, the Bible says, for God so loved the world, and you think, well, God loves the world, and when sometimes you mention God, you know, it's this God in heaven far away. No, for, for, for our daddy so loved us. Our loving father. He is, doesn't only love, but he is love. He is the essence of love. You don't know true love unless you know him. That is the only real change that will come in your life. Because if you change your actions and your heart doesn't change, it's only, it's conforming, it's not change. And that gets old. And that's hard. It's a heavy yoke. It's a burden that's too hard to, to and, and, it, and it creates strife. It, it's religious. It causes problems, but, you know, it's one thing to make a commitment and say, I will never be with another woman the rest of my life for no reason. But when I get married, now I have a reason. It's that love relationship that wants me to be faithful and keep myself, as the wedding vow says, only to her as long as I shall live. It's that love for someone else that causes you to make such a great sacrifice or, or, or to put everything else aside. That is the heart of the gospel. We change because we love him. Because he loved us first. You know, the debt we owed was, was death. The penalty 
of sin is death, and we all have sinned. God, knowing that if He gave us free will, we would sin, had a plan to take care of that before He created the earth. That song doesn't only apply for me, it applies quadruply for God. You are always on my mind. Including before the foundation of the earth, He knew you. He had a plan for your life. And if you read the plan, it wasn't to keep you in the dark and make you barely get along and, and struggle through life and just hope and we just keep praising God. No, it was a plan to give you hope and a future to prosper you. It's a good plan that He had for you. He knows your every heart's desire. It wasn't my heart's desire to be a pastor that I knew. I wanted to be an evangelist. And, and not just the one that just goes out and tells it. That part I'll always do. I wanted to travel. I wanted to go to churches and preach a message. And then have them take me and play golf and go fishing. And travel all over the United States and all over the world. And then when people said I have a problem, I just said, Oh, you see that guy over there? He's your pastor. Go well, talk to him. That was my heart's desire. I saw what Pastor Tom went through and said, I don't want to do it. He helps people and then they talk about him. They accuse him of not wanting to be a pastor anymore because he didn't. I'm like, are you for real? You know how many times we've prayed for you? I've had people, I've helped them out and then two weeks later they wrote me a letter calling me Judas. I say, I don't want to do this. But when, when God knew how he wired me, and the funny thing is other people saw it and I didn't. And I was like, all right, God, I'll show you this won't work. Watch, we're going to start a church. It's going to end in like three weeks because nobody will come. <laughs> <laughs> and then when I started doing it, I was like, wait, what, what's this? I like this. I, if I was an evangelist, evangelist and I was traveling around the whole country, I would have very shallow relationships. Who would I really get to know? And I was like, man, I don't want to do that anymore. And I definitely don't want to be away from my wife. What was I thinking? Travel, see your wife five days a month and your kids? I definitely didn't want to do that. But he knew the plan he had in me and knew I wasn't wired that way and had a different plan. He has a plan for your life. And, and it's a plan from a loving daddy. You can trust it. Once you taste, he said, taste and see that the Lord is good. Once you experience that love. And, and we mentioned as we were walking through the Holy Land and all the places Paul was and, and how many times he was beaten and kept coming back and was whipped and left for dead and shipwrecked. He's like, what kept this guy going? He'll say he was brave and he was courageous. Yeah, he was. But it was this love of God that was compelling him. I don't know about you, but if I snuggle up to God and I start talking to him, it's not long before he starts laying on my heart people that need help. Because that's his heart. He loves his children. And that was the heart that Paul had for people. You know, we, we go share this message of God's love. It, it has to be the love of God. It, it, let me read the scripture for you real quick. Romans 8, 6. You can put it up on the screen, please. Romans 8, 6. <clears throat> and, and again, when I say evangelism, I'm not talking about walking up down the street, walking up to every person, and saying, you know, are, are you a Christian? Do you want Jesus? I mean, you, you're going to short circuit somebody. They're going to look at you like you are nuts. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about lifestyle evangelism. Amen. Letting your light so shine. When everybody else is getting fired and, and wondering what they're going to do and crying, and you sit there and go, God's got it. 
What is, everyone's upset but you. That's letting your light shine. Like what Brother Hagin said, I got inside information. The Holy Ghost inside of me is telling me he's got it. Let your light shine. When, when somebody gets a promotion for you, before you, that you really deserve, and other people in work are saying, how come they got it? You're like, don't worry about it. God's got it. You're not mad? Why would I be mad? Sometimes inside you're going, man, it's so unfair, but you're just like, no, I'm not giving in to that. That's letting your light shine. The light of the gospel. What the gospel says we do. That's when your light shines. So you're different. Romans 8, 6 says, The mind of the flesh is death, but the mind of the spirit is life and peace. The mind of the flesh, which is sinful pursuits, is actively hostile to God. Another version says it's an enemy with God. So someone walking around without the spirit of God on the inside of them, they have two voices, well, three voices. Well, they have four voices. I, I'm not... They have their flesh, which is hostile, telling them to stay away from God, that God wants to harm them. Sin is much better, much more fun than going to church and loving God. They got their mind that says, yeah, I've gone to church, I'd be bored. So you got those two voices. You got the devil chiming in, but then you got the voice of God saying, come. So when we go talk to somebody who, the, the next sentence says like this, it, the, the mind apart from God, it does not submit itself to God's law, and it cannot. So if you talk, start talking about forgiving people and, and biblical principles of giving, you know, people blow a gasket when they hear about tithing. <laughs> that, that scripture explains why. It, it does not submit itself to God's law, and it cannot. The Bible says the message of the cross, the whole gospel, is foolishness to those who are perishing. So, so to try to tell somebody who's struggling in life, and the only peace they got is from a bottle, or, or, or you tell them, oh, you shouldn't be doing that. No, you're, you're preaching the wrong message. That's not the issue. The issue is, the love of God. Because when change comes, your desire for things change. You know, long ago I had a, a calzone. And I got food poisoning. My desire for calzones have changed. I still look at them and go, nah, about that. I was so sick. Well, God wants you to be sick of sin. He, he wants you to understand the consequences of sin and how it harms you and takes you away from him and, 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 and allows an open door for the devil to bring sickness and poverty and all these things that the devil's bringing in that you're saying, well, God has a plan. No, it's not God's plan. It's the devil's plan. And not knowing these things, the Bible said, my people destroyed for a lack of knowledge. When you understand the love of the Father, and how much he loves us. And boy, you almost have to have a child to really start to understand that. And I say start purposely. You know, you can be afraid of heights, but if your child's stuck on top of a building, you can get over that fear and climb out on that building and do what you got. You don't care if you die. That's what the heart of the father does. The heart of the Father allowed His Son to die. The heart of the Father, the love of God was in Jesus, compelled Him to the cross. And He counted it joy. Because He saw us on the other side. It is the love of God. 1 John 4.10 1 John 4.10 says, This is real love. Not that we loved God, but that God loved us and sent his son as a sacrifice to take away our sins. And if I can interject there, the Bible says, while we were yet sinners, while we were an enemy of him. The Bible says friendship of the world is to be an enemy of God. While we were friends with the world, an enemy of God, that's when he done, did this. Dear friends, since God loved us so much, we surely ought to love one another. 
with the same love. Or as the scripture says, it's the foundation of this church, love as Jesus loved us. He loved us when we didn't deserve it. He loved us while we were spitting in his face. He loved us when he wasn't going to get anything in return. There was no condition on his love. It was constant. So we should love each other with the same love. No one has ever seen God. But if we love each other, God lives in us. And his love is brought to full expression in us. This is our goal as a Christian, that this love of God takes expression in and through our life. That's evangelism. Because you could speak a whole lot of Christian words and biblical and quote the Bible, but if this love isn't the power behind it, it's useless. You'll do more harm than good sometimes if you say one thing and do another that's a hypocrite. You will do more harm than good. This expression, this full expression, should be in us and through us. 1 John 4.18 says this, Such love has no fear, because perfect love expels all fear. If we are afraid, it is for fear of punishment. And this shows that we have not fully experienced his perfect love. Listen to those words. We have not fully experienced this love I'm talking about. You could come to church and be very religious. You could quit smoking, quit, quit drinking, and, and never, you really just become a Pharisee, which Jesus said, you're a whitewashed tomb. Outwardly, you've got it all down. But what's going on inside? Have you fully, you might have experienced a portion of his love that led you to salvation, you got saved, but it's in fully experiencing this love on the inside that really brings lasting, meaningful, joyful change to your life. It makes you want to change more because you want more of this love. That has to be the motivating factor. I could go so many different directions with this. I'm going to try to hold off. Hebrews 3, 7. Hebrews 3, verse 7. It says, today when you hear his voice, don't harden your heart. <laughs> Just changed pages on me. Excuse me for that. Today when you hear his voice, don't harden your heart as Israel did when they rebelled. They tested me in the wilderness. There your ancestors tested and tried my patience even though they saw my miracles for 40 years. Well, first of all, we see they had something to base it on. God wasn't just saying, you know, if I'm a complete stranger and I walk up to you and say, trust me. You'd be like, I don't trust you. I don't even know you. But if I've paid your rent for five years straight every week, and then you're worried about paying rent next week, and I say, I got it. You're like, all right, I'll trust them. So he's saying, they saw my miracles. They were delivered. The sea parted. There was plagues. And all this stuff happened. And then he's saying, trust me, and they murmured instead. So when, when Joshua and Caleb were saying, we can do this, they were going, no, we can't. We want to go back to Egypt. We want to go back to bondage. We were better off there. When they heard the words, you can be victorious. God has a plan. They, they didn't listen. They rebelled against it. And when you rebel against the word of God, your heart becomes hard. Your heart becomes hard. A, a callous. You don't feel. If you love your sin more than God and more than his word... And, and, and you start justifying your sin, you start to get callous where when he's speaking, you don't hear him. That's right. That's right. And that same voice you need to hear that tells you, stop here, don't go through that light, wait a minute, is the same voice that's going to tell you you ought not to be thinking that way. You, you can't pick and choose when you hear that voice. You either got your hearing aid up or down. That's right. And if you start lowering your hearing aid, when God says you ought to forgive that person, you're not going to hear him when it says there's someone about to run a red light. You need to wait. 
There's a benefit for living holy. To live in the protection of God. When God says, go talk to that guy over there, and he goes, oh, you're in church, here's a check for a million dollars. You're not going to hear him when he tells you to do stuff like that. I mean, that's an exaggerated example. But he will lead you to, to avenues of blessings in your life. Amen. He will lead you to jobs. He will give you to a job that in the natural you're thinking this one's better. They pay more and you're thinking all the reasons in the natural. God says, don't do it. Take this one. And, and, and I know someone that that happened to. And, and that company went under months later and they still had a job. And thank God it was like, didn't go by total reason and logic. How do you keep from having a hard heart? First of all, if you're unsaved, the gospel is preached in America a lot. And people have made a decision, I don't want it. So their heart has become really hard. The way not to have a hard heart as a Christian is to have that father-child relationship with your daddy. To experience this love. Not the rules, but the relationship. How do you stop from having a hard heart? It, it has, you just have a desire to please Him. That will keep your heart from getting hard. You know, we read in the Bible where it says, God hardened Pharaoh's heart. I would read that story and say, okay, if I told you to pay this bill, but then I took the money away from you to pay the bill, that, that would be unfair. So I read the story. How could God punish Pharaoh for something he did? I'm thinking, that just doesn't make sense. There's, if you don't understand something, just sit back. God will give you revelation because it all makes sense. Just don't, just, it may take you years to get an answer. So, so as I was praying about that, I, God showed me what, what happened. This hard heart issue. When the sun comes out or heat is presented, Dirt and clay will get hard, dry up and get hard. But if you apply the same heat to wax, it'll melt. You choose your heart. You choose whether you're wax or clay. That's your choice. Obedience will cause that heat to melt you and keep you soft. Rebellion and living, you know, wanting to keep doing your own thing when that heat comes and you constantly reject it, will harden your heart. So when God told Pharaoh what to do and he didn't listen, if I'm watering my lawn and I say, don't, don't go over there, you'll get wet, and then you walk on the lawn, well, technically, I wet you, but it's really your choice. You're the reason. You, I didn't wet you. You walked in front of the hose. So God doesn't harden people's hearts that way. It's your response to what he's doing that hardens your heart. You know, in, in, in these subjects, sometimes you have to understand a little bit about the Hebrew language and the way things were written. I had a conversation last night. It was interesting. Just Some things we're just not going to understand. And, and when I accepted that, I wanted, to, I'll share a little bit of this later, I wanted to understand because I loved God and I didn't want to get it wrong. But when I realized I'm never going to be, know this 100%, especially while I'm here on earth. The Bible says we see through a glass dimly. So how can I argue with another Christian that sees something a little different than me when we're both looking through a dim glass? No, I... I think that's a guy. No, it's a girl. No, it's a guy with long hair. We don't have a clear picture. You're stupid if you think it's a girl. No, we don't have a clear picture. Amen. And this love thing has to rise above that. Yeah. Well, you think it's a girl, I think it's a guy. Okay, we'll just go on our way. So when I understood I'm not going to know everything perfectly, it was liberating. Because <laughs> this thing I do know, this is my commandment that you love one another. <laughs> I could do that. I may not get everything right, but I can do that. In the Hebrew language, there's no phrase that says allow. So, 
when it sounds like in scripture sometimes where God did something, it's really saying he allowed it. And it's understood in the writing. Just like this, he, he, he didn't harden his heart. There's more into the explanation. Uh, I'll give you another example. The Bible says you must love God and hate your parents. Well, there's no word in the Hebrew that says love less. You must love your parents less than you love God. So they would say you love one and hate the other. And that hate is not the same way that we look at hate. When I was preaching one day, I got up and said, I hate the ministry. <laughs> People are like, oh, well, it's, you know what? I, I just hate what's going on in my life. And I sometimes I hate my wife. People are like, what is this guy? My mother-in-law was here at the time. I was like, oh, she, <laughs> Yeah, I, I love ministry less than I lo love my, my God. I love my wife less than I love God. So if I'm supposed to hate my parents, then i got to hate all this too. God has to be on top. So sometimes in, in interpreting the scripture, we need to understand uh, there's certain rules of interpretation. Some things were written in, in a culture that made sense to them. You know, if someone read something 2,000 years from now, and they... You know, someone says, wow, that car's bad. They're going to assume that the car's a wreck. But you've got to know a little bit about the culture. Oh, that was a compliment. So, so in interpreting the Bible sometimes, you, you have to have a little light, a little understanding. You have to go a little bit far, farther. 1 Corinthians 2.14. And again, when we're sharing this message... When you're sharing, sharing this message, you've got to keep these things in mind. <coughs> you know, sometimes I've said things to people and they weren't quite ready to hear it. Sometimes people assume you mean one thing when you mean another. Sometimes you try to explain the best you can and it comes out wrong. But, but there's this, this love thing that has to be in the middle of all this. Anybody knows me knows it's not my intention to hurt anybody. I, I would never do anything intentionally to hurt somebody. 1 Corinthians 2.14 says this. People who aren't spiritual can't receive these truths from God's spirit. It all sounds foolish to them and they can't understand it for only those who are spiritual can understand what the spirit means. So again, don't get in debates with people uh, that, that aren't born again, who don't have the life of God in them. They, they just, just bring it back to God loves you. When I first got saved, that's all I knew. I'd go down and say, I'm a Christian. God really loves me so awesome. He should come to church. Well, what about the rapture? What? What is that? I don't know. God loves me. You're so incredible. Guy said, I used to love God, but I'm backslidden. I was like, what's that? I used to go to church, I don't go anymore. No, 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 you didn't know God like me because you can't walk away from this. This is the greatest thing ever. Now, now you're bad, you're no good, you're a sinner, you're going to go to hell. What, what's, what's more appealing? You falling in love with God and just let it gush out of you? You determine this life, I am going to be a happy person. Don't worry be happy. I mean, just live that way. That will attract more people. It's not correction that leads you to change. It's love and it's, it's comfort. Amen. Amen. Okay, I'm running out of time. What can I skip? Here's one because I kind of mentioned it earlier that we are responsible for each other. The Hebrews 3.13, I want to give you a scripture for this stuff. It's not just my point of view. Hebrews 3.13 says, You must warn each other every day, while it is still today, so that none of you will be deceived by sin and hardened against God. Sin is deceiving. Self-deception 
It's one of the worst kinds of deception. When you've convinced yourself everything's okay when it's not, I can't really go much further in here because it's, I'm going to have to pick up here eventually because this is too much. I'll introduce it. When God judges us, what does He judge? He judges our heart, not our actions. Do you realize one person could do something and to them it is sin and the other person could do the exact same thing and it's not sin? How many people here think that that just quite doesn't make sense? Oh, you're all that spiritual, huh? It didn't make sense to me when I first heard it. But I'll give you an example. If let, Let's use falling asleep in church as an example. Anybody's asleep? Wake up, because you know what? I'm not talking to you. I haven't seen anybody sleeping. So I'm not pointing anybody out. You know, you, you got to be clear because people think you're talking about them. This was in my notes three days ago. So if you're falling asleep, you just, if the shoe fits, wear it. But I'm not picking on you. But I will use this as an example. There, there is a certain amount of honor and expectation. What do we say about your flesh? Your flesh does not want to come to church. Yeah. Never. Never ever in the whole course of your whole life will your flesh wake up and say, hey, let's go to church today. Never, ever. It's too cold, it's too hot, it's too raining. I mean, I got to do this, I got to do my Lord. I mean, your, your mind and your flesh. That's why it says to remove new your mind. Your mind says, we got to do the laundry. Just shut up, we're going to church. And, and then you got a next step. It's not just making it into the building. It's starting to say, this is the holy written word of God. God has given me a gift to the pastor. And he's going to share the word of God. And I'm going to receive something today that will change my life and change other people's lives. So you sit there and when you're in church and start falling asleep, your spirit says, get up. Grab yourself by the neck and say, sit up in that chair and pay attention. This could save your life one day. These are choices we make. When I come to church, I like to sit on the front row. I take my iPad out and I'm like, and I'll tell you what, if I'm coming to church I'm a little tired, I'll drink a Red Bull. I am not falling asleep while the Word of God is being preached. I'm not doing it. You know, sometimes when you go to meetings for a week and you're there every night, it gets to you. You're like, okay, how about... <laughs> and sometimes I'll start doodling because I'm doing something that stops me from sleeping, but I'm still listening. My was like, stop doing that, stop doing that. <laughs> so if you're up late at night watching TV, or you're out partying and you're doing that and you can't stay awake in church, that's a lack of honor and respect for God, the man of God, your brothers and sisters in church. And you fall asleep and God told you you need to work on that, you're in trouble. And the more you don't listen, that's where you start to get a hard heart. Let's look at the other guy doing the same action, fall asleep in church. Because this is a true story. There was a guy in church came to Pastor John and said, Pastor, I'm not sure what I need to do. I work midnights. I get out of work at 9 o'clock in the morning. It takes me an hour to get here. And at 10 o'clock when the service starts, I'm wiped out. And he, he says, I fall asleep. I try hard, but I fall asleep. Well, this guy honored the word of God and the pastor so much that he was trying to force himself to church. He says, you know, I thought about changing my sleep schedule, you know, and, and sleeping in the afternoon and then going to work, but then... All week long, I wouldn't see my family because they were in school. So I can't change them. This is how much he was trying to honor God. He goes, Pastor, what do I do? I don't want to be disrespectful and fall asleep in church. Pastor said, you come and you take the best nap you ever had. <laughs> well, he's not sitting. There's a lot of honor in his life. Same action. That's why this thing it is a heart issue. We're going to dig into that a little bit more next time, I hope. We'll look at the story a little bit of David and Saul. I mean, in 
the natural, David seemed to do a whole lot worse than what Saul did. And Saul kind of cloaked it in spiritual, well, we were bringing it for an offering. Even if he was, he was still disobedient. David committed adultery, murder, and hiding it. I mean, but when he was confronted, he said, sorry. And God said, he's a man after God's own heart. After all he did that, after all that he did, God still considered a man after God's own heart. You know how you know your heart is tender towards God? I don't care if you're sinning. I mean, I do, but that's not the issue. You could be smoking, doing drugs, whatever sin you want to plug into there. But, but what happens, you know, on your way home and you, you, you put a song on. I was listening to a song last night. That, not that I was out sinning. I went to see my dad. But I put a song on. I'm hungry for you. I just start weeping in my car. So if, if you just finish messing up, and that song comes on, and you're like, oh, I'm so sorry, I love you so much, I just, I just need more of you. I, listen, you're in a good place. But if you just finish messing up, and you say, well, other people are doing it, that is dangerous. Well, this is my only vice, I'm good over here and here. No, 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 call it sin, call it what it is. Don't try to justify it. Say you're sorry and move on. Amen. Amen. All right, I gotta stop there because I could I could really. I know I've shared this story with my brother several times. I'll share that next time. You want to hear it? You gotta come back. If you're living right, outwardly only, you're a whitewashed tomb. Jesus was harsh on those people. He called them snakes, sons of snakes, whitewashed sepulchers. I mean, he just, he said the gospel, the heart of God is nowhere near you. You put more of a burden on people. This love has to be what we live for, what we respond to, what we convey. It's lasting. You want more of it, it's addicting. But God never takes the choice of free will away from you. Amen. You can stand and we'll close in prayer. Thank you, Jesus. You know, when you play chess or most any game you play, you know, there's your turn and then their turn. When I move, I sit back, it's your turn. God already had his turn. Before he knew what your move would be, regardless of what your move would be, he sent Jesus to die. And then he said, now it's your turn. I've loved you first. I paid the ultimate price. I gave my son to die for you because I love you. That I proved my love to you. Now it's your turn to love me back if you so choose to. And no one can make that choice for you. Just because mommy and daddy go to church and grow up in a Christian home doesn't mean you ever made that choice. Just because you attend the church. The Bible says Jesus stands at the door of your heart and not. The Spirit of God had to leave because of sin. When Adam sinned, the Spirit of God, they died spiritually. Jesus dies on the cross comes back and sees his disciples and the first thing he does it says he breathed on them and he received the Holy Spirit the same thing he did to Adam so they became a living being he's offering that experience to you today not offering you church not offering you a religion not putting a whole bunch of things before you that if you live up and you're good enough then someday maybe you know we'll weigh it out and get to heaven no either you have the son or you don't the Bible says if you have the Son, you have life. If you don't have the Son, you don't have life. You're, you have an opportunity today that you may not have an hour later. No one has promised. Amen. Today, right now, is the moment. If you've never asked Jesus to come into your heart, now is the moment. Yes, yes, yes. If you'd like to do that, just raise your hand. You know, they do it funny. Well, everybody bow your head, close your eyes. Listen. If you can't raise your hand in here, you ain't going to last out on the street. There has to be something in you that says, I want this, I don't care what anybody thinks. First of all, everybody else in here has done it. But 
there's something about, he said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before the Father. You're like, I don't care if he knows. Yes, yes. If you've never done it, raise your hand boldly right now. We'll pray with you. And you can enter into this life. You can go from darkness to life. That life of God will come in you. And when you get to heaven, he's not going to ask how good you were, how bad you were. He's going to say, do you have the son? Where's your ticket? Uh -huh. yes. That is it. Because all of the things you've done wrong are washed away anyway. If that was enough to get into heaven, if not sinning was enough to get into heaven, Jesus already did that for you. All of your sins are already forgiven. He did that so he can live in you because he couldn't live in you with sin. So he took the sin out and said, your move. I know there's one and maybe two at least that need to do this today. That's why I'm spending a little bit more time. Can you imagine standing before Jesus and this moment being played back and you never did it? And you know, wow, I had the opportunity and I let it go. It cost you nothing. No money. I'm asking you to receive this love. And the plan that God has for your life that's better than any plan you could think of. I'm not asking you to join this church. I'm just asking you to accept the one that loves you so much. I'll give you one more opportunity just to raise your hand and we'll just say a simple prayer. We're not going to shake your head and send you to the airport. We're just going to love you. We just want to welcome you into our family. Oh, we have a hand. Okay. There's still another though. There's still another. 